The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. I realize I'm dying. An ecstasy overdose. There's no way to control this. One addict pops his final pills. And I have probably limited moments left. His last words. Please don't kill me yet. And what saved his life. I would have kept going until I was dead in the dirt. On today's 700 Club. And then all of a sudden, instantly done. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. California is now under a state of emergency. This comes after its first coronavirus death. Cases in the Golden State have spiked to 54 in most of the country. That's what the Congress is doing to stop the spread of this deadly virus. Jenna Browder has more. This is the first death reported in California and the first outside Washington state as the coronavirus continues its spread across the United States. Health officials revealing the man was likely exposed on a cruise to Mexico that returned last month. California officials are now trying to track down other passengers. Testing kits are being flown aboard the same ship after new passengers complained of flu-like symptoms. The ship will not come on shore until we uh, appropriately assess uh, the passengers. Governor Gavin Newsom declaring a state of emergency as the number of California cases shoots to at least 54, the most in the country. Los Angeles County also declaring a local emergency. We need every tool at our disposal to make sure we're ready to support any coronavirus patients who are diagnosed and to prevent any further spread. In New York, hundreds are under self-quarantine after family members and neighbors of a victim tested positive. Nationwide, that brings the total number of cases to more than 150 in 17 states and 11 confirmed deaths. Globally, the death rate is much higher. More than 95,000 people in at least 80 countries have been infected. The death toll over 3,200. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., the House has approved $8 billion in funding to fight the disease, including $3 billion for developing treatments. The bill now goes to the Senate, where it's expected to pass today. And the CDC is expanding its guidelines on testing, allowing more people to get tested. Vice President Pence trying to reassure Americans. If you are a healthy American, the risk of contracting the coronavirus remains low. Pence says more than one and a half million testing kits are being shipped across the country. Today, he and members of his team are heading to Washington State, the epicenter of the outbreak in the United States, to meet with the state's governor. In Washington, D.C., Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, CBN Health reporter Laurie Johnson is here to bring us the latest reports on the effort to fight the virus. And uh, Laurie, the most of the deaths apparently come from one nursing home. Can you tell us what's being done to help people in nursing homes like this? Pat, yesterday the White House Coronavirus Task Force announced the government agency which oversees nursing homes is going to this particular one in the Seattle area to investigate what happened there. Meanwhile, they're ramping up their efforts to make sure all nursing homes nationwide are following strict anti-infection protocols. At the same time, they're warning the general public to not visit a nursing home if you're sick, pointing out that 80 percent of people who catch this virus will have very mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. But the people most at risk of being hospitalized and even dying from it are people who are elderly or have underlying health issues. This includes people who aren't healthy or who aren't elderly, but who may have an, a compromised immune system, such as people who are undergoing chemotherapy cancer treatments, Pat. I've read that the cases in China are diminishing. Is that just on account of their statistics? Or what's going on? Well, that's the bright spot in this whole case, in this whole situation. The cases of the new cases and the number of new deaths is absolutely plummeting in China to the point where the number of new cases and new deaths are higher outside of China than within China. This time, just last month, Pat, we were talking about 2,000 new cases a day. Now it's hovering around only 100. We saw one of the coronavirus hospitals that was so quickly 
built. They closed it for lack of patience. Production is ramping up, manufacturing of products that we depend on. And experts in the healthcare industry are wondering why this is happening. Is it because this virus like, is maybe a seasonal virus, like so many other coronaviruses that we know about that are associated with the common cold? Or is it because of China's strict containment measures, or both? Why you, you and I were talking about uh, the gut, you were talking about the immune system, and the fact that people in this country could be pretty much spared any ill effects from coronavirus. You want to tell us about that? Well, the CDC is, again, reminding people that, that uh, to not get the virus in the first place, and the best way to not even be infected in the first place is to keep your hands clean and to not touch your face. Then, of course, if you do become infected with it, having a strong immune system certainly helps. And one of the best ways to have a strong immune system and to build your immune system is to keep that gut healthy. We know that our immune system tends to diminish and deteriorate in weaken as we age. Well, you said something that you said 80 percent of the immune system is located in this gut floor. Am I correct in that? That is absolutely correct. All those good bacteria doing their <laughs> jobs, they, they protect us from getting bacterial, bacterial and viral infections, as well as other health issues. Thank you, Lori. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to show you, we have had an unbelievable uh, response. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of people wanted this news alert, mm -hmm. coronavirus, what do you need to know? We've got this out, this fact sheet the Laurie has prepared. And we also have this wonderful booklet on how to build a better gut. Why should you get sick and die with this bug? The thing of it is, they've learned that it's about 3.4% of the people that get it actually die. So it's in nursing homes and things like that. But if you've got a strong immune system, you don't have to be concerned. So we will give this to you. So build a better gut. It's free. Just dial 1-800-700-7000. And we also have a fact sheet on the coronavirus. So uh, that, that's what you can do. Can I mention also, Pat, some people I know like to um, text to get things. So let me give you that information. Yeah. You can text gut health, mm -hmm. all one word, to 41444. And we'll be happy to get it out to you. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, this business about it's a pandemic and everybody's so scared. I want to share you something that the Bible says that I want you to take to heart because I am not scared. You don't have to be scared. <clears throat> the Bible says, fear not. Now, here's what the Paul wrote to Philippians. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. I don't care what you heard in the news. I don't care how many states of emergency are being declared and all this uh, uh, scurrying around. It still is only a very few people who have had this <clears throat> coronavirus in the United States. And a majority of those are elderly or those with uh, uh, faulty immune systems. So. Fear not. <clears throat> Don't be anxious. The Lord has got it under control. Well, in other news, a powerful Democrat is under attack after just uh, over the top threatening of two Supreme Court justices. It was one of the most shocking displays of wrath by a leading public official that I think that I have ever heard of. Ephraim Graham has more. Pat, the Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer coming under fire for comments and attacking Supreme Court Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. He was speaking at a rally outside the high court as it heard arguments in a Louisiana abortion case. Schumer appeared to threaten President Donald Trump's appointees. I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. You won't know what hit you if you go forward with these awful decisions. 
Chief Justice John Roberts responding with this statement. Justices know criticism comes with the territory, but threatening statements of this sort from the highest levels of government are not only inappropriate, they are dangerous. President Trump also weighing in and, weighing in and tweeting, there can be few things worse in a civilized law-abiding nation than a United States senator openly and for all to see and hear threatening the Supreme Court or its justices. This is what Chuck Schumer just did. He must pay a severe price for this. A spokesperson for Senator Schumer later said he was talking about the political price Republicans will pay for putting Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch on the court. Pat? He didn't say any such thing. He named the justices that you're going to pay a price, and we're going to see to it that you receive this price. And what is it they're going to do? Will they... They might uh, limit the freedom of abortion, and that's what he's talking about. And um, the whole idea of the culture of death, we want to be able to kill babies. I remember that debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. I could not believe it, but Hillary Clinton would not budge on the whole concept of partial birth abortion after a baby is actually out of the birth canal that the doctor can punch a hole in his skull suck out its brains and kill it. That's partial birth abortion. The birth is partially there. And she would not back up one iota. And Chuck Schumer is apparently one of those radical leftists. And that's what they want to do. Uh, there's a culture of death. And we stand for life. It's just that simple. Ephraim? Pat, Tennessee residents devastated by Tuesday's powerful tornadoes continue picking up the pieces in their shattered communities today. Authorities now say the deadly tornado that hit Putnam County was an EF4 with 175 mile an hour winds. Two other tornadoes ripped through parts of Nashville and Wilson County. Thousands are still without power after the twisters took out 600 utility poles. At least 24 people are dead. Authorities have identified many of the victims, including at least five children, all under the age of 13. Pat? Well, I want to say Operation Blessing is active now in this area. And uh, we, of uh, Hunger Strike Force, completes two food drops, 31 pallets of emergency supplies weighing over 31,000 pounds, including bottled water, food, and cleaning supplies. And their risk assessment is working with local law enforcement. We want to help those people. And so Operation Blessing, if you want to participate in helping Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, it's 1-800-707-7000. So let's do something to help our friends down in the Nashville area. It was a horrible hurricane, and they've upgraded it to a category of four, would it? Sort of four. I, I, you Unbelievable. Know, I just, the fact that it struck at night. Yeah. Like really, people were just sitting well, targets. People are dead. They're still, uh, I think, searching through the wreckage to see if there's anybody else hurt. But it was just a terrible, terrible tragedy. And the nation stands with our friends in Tennessee for what went on there. Terry? Well, still ahead. Will the real St. Patrick please stand up? We're busting the myths about the patron saint of Ireland and going behind the scenes of a new film to get the real deal. Stay tuned for that. But first, it's a forgotten war, and still it rages on. CBN's George Thomas takes us to the front lines of the battle when we return. It's a forgotten war, but what happened to the ceasefire signed five years ago? The battle rages on between soldiers in eastern Ukraine and Russian-backed fighters trying to seize their land. Those living on the front lines have been ravaged and continue to suffer, hanging on to hope. CBN's George Thomas traveled to the war zone to bring us this exclusive report. Here's George. This is what's left of houses near the frontline town of Zolote. By midday Tuesday, February 18th, 2300 explosions rocked the area as Ukrainian troops and Russian-backed separatist forces clashed in some of their fiercest fighting. Alexander Kornev was in his house when the first series of explosions went off. I had just turned around and then there was a boom. I was thrown back to the steps. I was lying down for 20 minutes. 
Ukraine said Russian fighters attempted to advance across the separatist line into Zolote, but were repelled. We have a powerful army. Provocations happen. The army responded firmly. CBN News journeyed 90 miles south from Zolote to another battle-scarred village. Numerous Ukrainian checkpoints meant we were getting close to the front lines. <laughs> Traveling with us, Sergei Rakuba, who grew up in this region of Ukraine. We're in the village of Opetna, which was a vibrant, uh, dynamic uh, community before the war started between Russia and Ukraine. And the front line is basically separating this village in half. Rakuba, joined by a team from the Mennonite Brethren Church, delivered food, water and other essentials to families and soldiers living in Opetna. February 2014, Russian so-called separatists launched a massive hybrid war into this part of eastern Ukraine, in essence taking a chunk of the country. Six years later, communities like this one are a ghost town, except for a few families who have lived here for most of their lives and who vow never to leave. Once home to 700 people, only 60 now live in Opatnaya. There's been no electricity, gas or running water for more than five years. The streets here lined with bullet-scarred homes. The majority of houses unlivable. But we know that even here, God is here. And uh, people need to know, know the hope of God, that he brings the salvation. And so, it's, again, a special privilege to be able to pass out gifts, hand out food and pray with people and just share the love of Christ. Rakuba and Weeby climbed the steps of a bombed out apartment building carrying supplies. We didn't have no light for the last five years. Come on in, guys. The 78 year old leader, she lives in this tiny room with her son and four cats. No heat, no water, very little food. But there is no place to go for me. There is nobody, you know, I can go to. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm, I'm staying here, I'm just waiting. I lived here for 50 years and I will stay here. Pro-Russian rebels control half her village and much of eastern Ukraine, including key cities of Donetsk and Luhansk. They still uh, hear shooting, you know, farther there. At least once a day, once every two days, they still hear shooting. 14,000 people lost their lives in this region, half since Russia and Ukraine signed an agreement to end the war five years ago. 30,000 have been wounded and nearly 2 million people displaced from their homes. Rakuba says it's a forgotten war and it weighs on him. My teenage years and youth were spent here in the towns of eastern Ukraine. I remember how difficult it was for a Christian at that time to share one's faith and in general for the church to build influence in Soviet society. The war over the past few years has added even more darkness. So why don't we pray? We'll pray in Russian if you don't mind. Rakuba, a native of Ukraine, now lives in the U.S. and heads Mission Eurasia, a Tennessee-based group training young people to transform the countries of the former Soviet Union for Jesus Christ. Our vision at Mission Eurasia is to bring hope to society through young leaders and now bring the gospel to the next generation and to those living through difficult situations like in eastern Ukraine. Hundreds of Mission Eurasia leaders and volunteers recently crisscrossed the war zone and countries of the former Soviet Union delivering 120,000 Gift of Hope boxes to children. CBN News was there as dozens of youngsters met in this church basement to pack boxes. This is so exciting to see so many young people are working on this project. And this is just one of the packing and distribution locations. Several teams fanned out across towns and villages near the conflict zone, holding evangelistic outreaches geared to reaching young people, many hearing the gospel presentation for the very first time. I learned Jesus can help me in many difficult moments and help me not to give up. Each event ending with boxes of hope given to hundreds of children, each containing toys, school supplies, a Christian kids magazine called Spark, and a children's storybook Bible.
once the kids get back to their apartments, they're obviously excited about rummaging through their gifts and looking at all the various things that they got. Uh, incidentally, the Bible, along with the Spark magazine and each shoebox, has this QR code uh, on the back so they can use their smartphone, scan the code, and within seconds, they will have access to all the various local churches that they can get plugged into. Canada-based ShareWord Global partnered with Mission Eurasia to distribute the Spark magazine and place QR codes on each box linked to a Bible app with loads of information for kids and parents. The Bible app includes uh, multiple languages in different translations of the Bible, and there's uh, over 200 languages that are in audio as well. Rakuba says every gift of hope box placed in a child's hands is a chance to introduce the love of Jesus and impact families in a war zone. The boxes symbolize the future with Christ, and when put into the hands of children, they take them home. They and their families will realize that there's hope in God, hope in Jesus. George Tala, CBN News, Opadnaya, Eastern Ukraine. That story is exclusive to CBN. By the way, Orphan's Promise is working over there in that same area. We have helped replace folks from there and other mm -hmm. parts of Ukraine, lots of families. But, you know, like the elderly lady who was there, if you have no one to go to, yeah. they can't Terrible. move. And so we've sent in diapers and formula mm -hmm. and food for these people. Yeah. But it's life is so, hard. Terry, what's so, uh, you know, under the Obama administration, uh, he just let... Uh, he the, gave the, 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 blankets. The, yeah, the, well, the Russians just came in. The Ukrainians needed some lethal help. They needed some weapons. And we didn't send any weapons. We sent all this other stuff, but no weapons. They needed to get armed. And we allowed the Russians to take over the Crimea, just walked in and, and seized that part of the Ukraine, saying, well, it was part of the greater Russia. We're going to take it back. And, and nobody, I mean, America did not stand in the way. And, uh, you know, the president was um, tried, to, tried to impeach him because... Uh, something he was going to do that withheld aid or something. Well, I mean, he he finally released some uh, lethal aid so he'd give those people some firepower to, to stand up against the Russians. But we allowed Russia to take back the Crimea, which is a major part of the Ukraine. And now this section there where the fighting is going on, but there's such hopelessness. But the Church of Jesus Christ is moving, and we're just thrilled to see it. And uh, we're we're doing what we can but um, we needed to get some missiles and some tanks and some guns to arm those Ukrainian fighters because they were being overrun by Russia who wanted to take back Ukraine as part of greater Russia. And Obama did nothing about it. But, the, you know, so much. All right, Terry. Well, throughout generations, Christians like those we just saw have ventured into danger zones to share the good news of Jesus Christ. In the fifth century, Ireland was a treacherous place for outsiders, and few believers were willing to risk their lives to bring Christianity to this pagan island. But one young bishop named Patrick heeded the call of God to preach the gospel in Ireland, and the rest is history. CBN Films tells the true story of St. Patrick in a new docudrama, Let's take a look behind the scenes. I am Patrick. I think a lot of people get a little lost with the legends and the myths about St. Patrick. It's nice to do a little bit of myth busting. Patrick gets kind of distorted and blurred and everything, you know, and it's nice to put it all right, get, get it down once and for all and say, that's what happened. I mean, we interviewed like the seven leading experts on St. Patrick. We had access to the best information. And the more that I dug into it, I was like, you don't have to embellish the story of St. Patrick at all. It's just a delight to be able to have a story like that that's true. A docudrama is an interesting sort of way of telling a story because it's based upon fact. And this particular docudrama draws heavily from two pieces of writing that Patrick himself wrote. There is an element of pressure to get the story right because I'm Irish and I'm really proud that we've been able to make such a high quality epic movie about our patron saint. You don't want to miss this movie, I Am Patrick. 
Mark your calendars. It's March 17th and March 18th. And if you'd like to get tickets, go to IamPatrick.com and go now so you can get a good seat. Well, up next, he would tell his wife he was going to work and then disappear for days. A mar marital arts, a martial arts champion with a monster drug addiction. How did a closet help him come clean? And then later on, Pat returns to the hot seat to answer your email questions. Morris says, I engaged in sexual immorality and I am now a single dad. Are single dads still candidates for God's calling into ministry? Well, that's an honest question and Pat's going to give you an honest answer. It's coming up. Well, we've got a story for you now about Jeff Durbin. Now, Jeff was a fierce, world-class karate competitor, but Jeff was powerless over his own monstrous drug addiction. He met his match one night when he took so much ecstasy that he thought he was dying. But even that scare wasn't enough to make him stop using drugs. So what was? Take a look. I realize I'm dying. I'm dying. This is where it ends. And I recognize that there's no way to control this at this point. And I have probably limited moments left before I'm going to pass out. Jeff Durbin trained in martial arts from age four and by age 16 was a national competitor and owned his own karate school. I was on a national karate team. I was, I was competing in, in world championships, international championships, national championships. That was my whole life. One night after teaching karate, he flipped through the TV channels and heard Billy Graham preach the gospel. Wasn't raised in a Christian home and uh, wasn't raised going to church under the hearing of the gospel. I remember that something had completely changed in my mind in terms of how I thought about Jesus and the Bible. And I immediately became the person that was interested in reading the Bible and telling people about Jesus. Although he professed faith in Jesus, Jeff led a double life. There was sort of two sides to me. There was the Jeff that loved to read the Bible, talk about Jesus, but then there was the Jeff who was the national competitor and would, you know, um, be in relationships with girls outside of marriage. And I think if you would have seen me on a Friday or Saturday night many times, you wouldn't have known that I was a Christian because I was, you know, living with one foot in, in the Christian world via one foot in the world. Jeff married his high school girlfriend. Despite her wishes, he continued to go to clubs and party on the weekends. One night, he took his first drug, ecstasy. My life devolved into a pursuit of just drugs and alcohol, and um, I had a very young wife and uh, a young son that I would abandon. I would tell her I was going out to work, and I would disappear for a day, maybe two days at a time. I would do ecstasy, cocaine, alcohol, pills, what, whatever was available. She didn't discover to the very end of the year that I was using because I lied. I lied. I lied a lot. Despite his drug addiction, Jeff became a successful financial planner, giving him money to feed his drug habit. One night he took so much ecstasy, his heart started racing wildly and his body was overheating. He knew he was going to die. It was the one moment in that year where there was some clarity about who I was and what was happening. And I remember that I said to God, I said, please don't kill me yet. Let me come out of this, like bring me out of this, but don't kill me, please. And I know you should. By everything I've done, I know that you would be right to allow me to go. I said, but please not yet. And then all of a sudden, instantly, done. My heart went right back to normal. My everything was like, it was, it was like I snapped completely out of the most horrible physical experience in my life where I'm about to die. And instantly, like it never happened. After his plea to God, Jeff still did not change his ways. I was just a rebel. And I remember that I was right back at it again the next weekend. And it took really the Lord actually very shortly after that destroying my life for me 
which I'm so grateful for. In one day, um, I woke up to my car being repossessed, my electric being shut off, my water being shut off, an eviction notice on my door, and the people I was working for actually fired everybody on their staff, and then there was no paycheck. And now all I have is I'm sitting in my apartment with my wife, my one-year-old, and my baby now, and it's silent. And I remember all that I had in that moment was to listen to God. Jeff says God used that silence to speak to his heart, and he finally listened. I remember that I went into my closet, and um, I just remember being completely broken. Like I saw myself for who I was, just a mess, a rebel, a mess, a liar, an idolater. And I don't remember any prayer that I prayed. Except it was probably just desperation. It was like, please save me. Save me. And I remember saying, you're the boss. You, t you tell me what to do. Save me from my sin. And you tell me what to do. And that is where my life really began to transform, was, was there. And when I, when I turned to Christ as Savior and Lord of, of my life. Jeff says God helped him turn from his old ways and freed him from drugs. I would have kept going in myself until I was dead in the dirt. There's no question about that. The consequences weren't the thing. It was what God did to change my heart. That's why I'm not using ecstasy today. And that's why I'm not getting drunk today. That's, that's why, because my passions were totally transformed. And that's something, that's something I did. Jeff and his wife have been married over 20 years and have a large family. He worked as the chaplain at a drug treatment facility, which then became Apologia Church. As founding pastor, Jeff is passionate about sharing the gospel and reaching those who struggle with drug and alcohol addiction. It's good news that I get God. Right? It's good news that he, he has the power to save me from my sins. It's good news that I have peace with God. It's good news that I have his presence. It's good news that he's fulfilled all his promises. See, the glory of the gospel is not about me. It's about God. And the glory of the gospel is you get God. God is the good news. I get him. And that is not only who Jesus is to me, but also that is what I'm very thankful for. You know, when you read the book of Job, Job suffered all those torments. And finally, God appeared to him. He said, look, stand up and I'm going to talk to you. And he appeared to him, and Job said, I've heard about you with the hearing of my ears, but now my eyes have behold you, and I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, that's what happened to Jeff. He finally began to see himself. He saw God for who he was, and he saw himself. And until you come to that place, many of you, you say, well, I'm okay, I'm okay. You know, no, you're not. Well, I, I'm just doing a little, little coke. I'm doing a little ecstasy. I'm, I'm snorting a few lines. It's okay. I'm, I'm okay. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm okay. I'm okay. It's when Jeff got to the point where he realized what a horrible person he was, and he saw himself as God saw him. He was terrible. And God is altogether righteous. And Jeff was playing with God. And God dealt with him in the quiet, in the still small voice of the Lord. And Jeff realized what a terrible sinner he was. And you remember Jesus was telling him about the man who beat on his chest. The Pharisee said, God, I'm thank you that I'm not like other men. I tithe, I give all this stuff, and I'm, I'm such a nice man. I go to the synagogue all the time. And... Uh, he said he prayed with himself. And the other man, Pharisee, beat on his chest, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When we begin to realize that we're sinners, and a lot of people don't want to hear that. I remember years ago when I was uh, assistant pastor in a church, I went to see one old lady. She was, she was dying. And I went to pray with her, and I, I said, you know, you, you're a sinner. And she said, don't say that to me, young man. And uh, she was all angry that I would even suggest that she was. But she was. She was filled with pride. And pride is a horrible sin. But Jeff didn't realize until one day he confronted God. 
Now, that's what God wants you to face right now. God's looking you in the face. You're seeing the holy, righteous God who fills all the world. He is absolutely glorious, and he's holy and marvelous. And you are not to stand in his presence and brag about how good you are. You've got to come to the fact of who you really are. And when you find that, and just like Job, Job said, I see you now, and I abhor myself and repent. After all he's suffered, he said, I, I repent in dust and ashes. And after that, God restored him to everything. God doesn't want you to be beat up. He doesn't want you to be uh, in the ash heap all the time. He wants you to be recovered. And Jeff is not recovered. But he had to see himself. Now, let me ask you, do you see yourself as who you really are? Are you trying to play games? Do you think you're okay? Well, you're just part okay. Well, I can just uh, take a line here. I can snort a little bit here. I can smoke a little here. Uh, I can... Uh, have a couple of girls here. I can watch a little porn, and I'm okay. No, you're not. It's when you come to the fact that I am a sinner, and Jesus Christ died for sinners, and he died for me. If you want to make that decision right now, the Lord stands ready to see you made whole. He'll give you a brand new life. You don't have to die. You don't have to come to the end of yourself. You do have to die in a sense of your pride, but your life does not have to end because God wants to redeem it. And he says, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. And right now he's knocking. And if you'll open the door, the Son of God will come in and eat with you and be your friend and save you for all eternity. I want you to pray with me this prayer. Just bow your head and pray. I'm going to lead you in prayer if you'll pray with me wherever you are. Lord Jesus, that's right. Lord Jesus, I know you died for sinners, and you died for me. And I come before you, Lord, as a sinner. I've done things that are wrong, and you know what they are, and I know what they are. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart. So, Lord, I repent. And I ask that you will come and forgive me, that you will be my Savior, and from this moment on, be the Lord of my life. I surrender to you, Lord, and I thank you that you died for me. I take your death and your resurrection for my salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you heard my prayer. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wherever you are, I want you to call in. And look, I want to give you a little book that's called A New Day. But if you don't want to give us your name, that's fine. But you call anyhow. So I just prayed with Pat. I'm so thrilled. I want to confess what I've just done. It's 1-800-707-000. No finances involved. I'm going to give you this little booklet, by the way. It'll help you get going along the way. So please call right now. And somebody's here who loves you, cares about you. 1-800-700-7000. Okay? And the angels of heaven are rejoicing if there's just one like Jeff. But if the whole lot of it, it's even more. The angels are in an uproar, thanking God that you have come into the kingdom of God. All right? Terry, you've got something more. We sure do. Still ahead, she longed to look like a movie star. Instead, kids called her a monster. What hope was there for this desperate girl? See for yourself. That's coming up. Plus, your questions and some honest answers. Danny asks, if someone is saved, can that person still become possessed by a demon? Find out later on today's show. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The Democratic field of candidates for president is getting smaller. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg dropped out after a poor showing in Super Tuesday, throwing his support behind former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Elizabeth Warren is huddling with her advisors trying to decide whether to continue. If she drops out, that leaves only Biden and Senator Bernie Sanders. Biden scored big wins on Super Tuesday, taking 10 out of 14 states and roaring past Sanders in the delegate count. However, Sanders is leading in California where they're still counting votes. 
An amazing story of incredible devastation in those tornadoes in Tennessee. Take a look at the video posted on Twitter. People in one neighborhood recording video of damage at their home come across a Bible safely nestled in a tree. A friend of his tweeting the video and another person commenting, quote, that's amazing proof that God always lets his presence be known. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Elon couldn't escape the insults all around her. Other children called her a monster and ran away from her. They weren't the only ones. Her own parents abandoned her, too. What was wrong with her? Take a look. May Lawn was 11 when the woman she always knew as her grandmother told her she was adopted. Grandma Lou raised May Lawn as her own after she was found abandoned on the street because of her cleft lip and palate. I always taught her to be strong. I said, don't feel insecure because of your mouth. But kids ran from her like she was a monster. Once, a boy spat on her. While May Lawn hid her emotions when this happened, she could barely look at herself in the mirror. Deep down, I wanted to be beautiful. I hated myself, and I felt like a joke. She loved fairy tales and dreamed of having a mouth like the movie star she saw on TV. I hoped that I'd meet a fairy and she'd touch my mouth and make me all better. But when Mei Lon's adoptive dad died, she lost hope that she'd ever get surgery and be beautiful. So she started working in the fields. She'd never gone to school and could barely write her name. I had no friends, no future. I felt like a bird without wings. Then a neighbor told Mei Lon's grandma about CBN. We quickly paid for cleft lip and palate surgery. I'm experiencing a very different life now. I can finally go to school. I feel pretty. I can look at myself in the mirror and smell with confidence like a movie star. I'm so happy and free. It's all because of you, CBN. You give me a new life. You saw what her life would have been had this not happened. Isolated and outcast, she had no hope and no future. Her problem was solvable. What she didn't have was the means to make it happen. You made that possible, 700 Club members. We just want to say thank you. You changed her life forever. Listen, if you haven't joined the 700 Club, I want you to know you have the ability to join with the rest of us in doing this kind of thing around the world, making a difference in the lives of people without hope. When you call now, our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. The commitment is 65 cents a day, $20 a month. You can do that. You can join with the rest of us. We want to say thank you in advance, and we're going to say thank you in a concrete way by sending you Pat's book, 10 Laws for Success. You're going to love this. Keys to win in work, family, and finance. We all need that. And then we're going to send you a two-chapter whistle-wetter, if you will, of his book about to come out in a month or so. I have walked with the living God, about to celebrate a big birthday. And this talks about all that God has done in his lifetime. And this is going to be a great book. So we want you to have that. Most of all, we want you to join with us in touching the world with the love of Jesus. So call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Amen. Okay, time for some questions. Let's go for them. Okay. This is Morris, who says, I have always had a passion for doing God's work. But seven years ago, I engaged in sexual immorality, and I am now a single dad. My question are single dads still candidates for God's calling into ministry? Um, absolutely. Uh, the Apostle Paul, I don't know about him being immoral, but he was a single. He didn't have, he wasn't married. He was a bachelor. And uh, uh, there's, there's no, I mean, the Apostle Paul had, I mean, Peter had a wife, apparently, uh, but some are married and some aren't. And so the fact that you have committed one act of sin along the way or several acts of sin along the way. God forgives that. What God wants to do, and I want everybody to understand, His major purpose is not to beat you up and to send you to hell. 
I take no pleasure in the death of him who dies, he said. Now, he has no pleasure in it. But what he does want is sons and daughters who are cleansed from dead works to serve the living God. And so whatever you've done in the past, please know if you bring it before the Lord, he'll cleanse you. And then if, you, if service to him is what you desire, then he will open the doors and just take it one step at a time as he leads you open to one door after another, after another, after another. All right? Okay, Pat, this is Danny who says, Pat, if someone is saved and has invited Jesus into his heart, can that person still become possessed by a demon? Um, I think we've gotten possessed and, and, and influenced. I, I do believe that if somebody is, is filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no way that the Holy Spirit is inside of them as some demon can come in and kick them out. I just don't think that's going to happen. But can the devil try to discourage you? Of course. The devil can whisper in your ear, well, I don't think you ought to do that, or this is a dangerous course, or did God really say? Look, look at Adam and Eve. Did God say that you shouldn't eat the fruit? I mean, is he keeping something good from you? That's the lie that he's been telling all along. He's trying to keep something good for you. So. The devil can lie to you. Demons can lie to you and try to influence you. No question about it. You know, I've told, I can be a spirit-filled Christian, but I can be out in a picnic lying down and some ant can call into my ear. I mean, you know, it's, yes. it, 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 that, it, that can happen. All right, what's next? Okay, this is Susan who says, Second Corinthians 12, 2 mentions a third heaven. I haven't seen that anywhere else in the Bible. What is it? Well, I, I think the idea was that we have the earth, the surrounders, and then there's the next heaven where uh, the spirits are, and then the third heaven where God lives. And Paul said he was caught up into the third heaven, and he saw sights and sounds that should, could not be uttered. So I, I, I've, I've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the idea. I mean, there's several. There's a layer around the earth, and then the next heaven up there where these spirits are, then the next one where God lives. All right. This is a viewer who says, our children, now in their 50s, have wasted their money numerous times and claimed bankruptcy. Then they continued to spend recklessly and did not save anything for their future or our grandchildren's. Is it wrong if we change our wills to take them off as our beneficiaries? Look, it's your money, it's your money, and it's your will. And the idea of giving money to a profligate child, you're not doing him any favor, you're hurting him. But uh, you might want to provide a, tr a trust for your grandchildren and put somebody else in as trustee. It's your money. Whatever you want to do with it, you want to give it to the Lord's work, that's your business. But uh, of course you can change your will. All right. This is Rosalind who says, I'm worrying about the last days. What are we to do to be ready? What are the signs that we should look for? Well, the Lord gave several signs of what going to, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be wars and rumors and war, there'll be pestilence and famine and so forth. And all these things are happening, but they've been happening. Uh, I, I really believe that uh, uh, Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour. He said, I don't know it. The angels don't know it. Only the Father knows whether I'm going to come back and when the end is going to come. But we can see certain signs. But we are told as Christians, quote, occupy till I come. And so rather than speculating always in some prophecy is what's going to be fulfilled and when's the Antichrist going to be here and all that stuff, I think we'd be better to occupy. And what he's told us to do is to take the gospel to the four corners of the earth, to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That's the command. So our job is to take the word around the world and to look after the poor and the needy in, in our communities. That's what he wants us to do. And as far as his second coming, it doesn't hurt. It won't catch us unaware because we, we're not asleep. But uh, the day is going to come. It's going to catch people like a trap. But we'll leave you with today's power message from the book of Revelation. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Well, tomorrow, we've got a flight attendant miraculously survives a plane crash into the Potomac River. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we'll look forward to the next time we're together on the 700 Club. Bye-bye.